what a brilliant uh, morning. It's actually quite difficult to get up and preach when it, everything's been so brilliant. <laughs> you, don't, you don't want to spoil it. But um, let, let's just see if we can add, the, the Lord can help us to add to it. Um, there's quite a lot of familiar faces. And so for the people who don't know us, uh, I'm briefly going to tell you where, where I'm coming from. Um, I'm, I'm from Newcastle. I've been a Christian 33 years. I'm out, I saved out of a background of drugs, violence, immorality, prison, everything you, you wouldn't want one of your children to be involved in. And um, it's an absolute miracle that I'm alive, that I was alive to become a Christian. And um, I've been through a lot of spiritual warfare and attacks in the 33 years. And um, I'm a street preacher basically, but every now and again I, I come into churches. Um, so you'll, you'll have to uh, excuse the lack of eloquence. Um, and um, God's given us a message today for you. And um, I hope it's going to encourage you. So I would like you to turn to 2, two Kings chapter 7. And just before I read it, I'll, I'll give you a quick overview of, of the back of it. The, um, there's a, there was a city in Samaria, and it was surrounded by the Syrian army. Yeah. And um, the people were in this city, and in them days what the, what the enemy would do would be surround the city, and then, you know starve the people to death till they opened the gates and surrendered. And um, there had been cannibalism going on because some two women had ate one of the, sounds a bit strange thing to say, but they'd ate one of their babies um, because the people are just starving to death. So you probably think you would never eat another human being, but you, you wouldn't know if you would or not until you were in a position where you are starving to death and there's been plane crashes in the world where people have actually ate other people because they were starving to death. So um, that, was, that was the dire situation that they were in. So I'm, go I'm going to read um, from, chap from 2 Kings chapter 7 verse 3. And there was four leprous men at the entrance in of the gate. And they said one to another, why do we sit here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, there's just famine in the city, and we shall die there. But if we stay here, we're going to die also. Now therefore come and let us fall into the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we will live. If they kill us, we shall but die. And they arose up in the twilight to go into the camp of the Assyrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was nobody there. For the Lord had made a host, made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel is hired against us, the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians, to come upon us. Therefore they arose and fled in the twilight, left their tents, left their horses, their asses, even the camp as it was, and they fled for their life. And when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent, and they did eat, then they did drink, and they carried the silver and the gold and the clothes, and they went and they hid it. And they came again and entered into another tent, and carried it also, and they went and hid it. And this is the key verse. And then they said one to another, we do not well this day. We do not well because this day is a day of good tidings and we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief may come upon us. Now therefore come that we may go and tell the king's household. And then, you know, just, just to cut it short, they actually go and they tell the, 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 the king and the people come out and all of the people who are starving uh, get fed. So, um, we've got the lepers, and obviously they didn't allow them in amongst the, you know, the people with good skin, like some of you. Um, 
because they didn't want to catch leprosy so they're outside the gate and they're in a bit of a dilemma because inside the gate they're starving to death and in, in, in you know just out not far away is the Syrian army so they say well we're gonna die so we might as well take you know a chance and see if they don't kill with but if they kill, we're going to die anyway. It was like a lose lose, but they just thought, well, just on an off chance, we'll see if something will happen. And God had done a miracle, and the people, the army had fled. So they got there, and then, uh, you know, this, some, one of them sees a kebab or a sandwich or a, you know, pot of stew, what have you, and he just eats it. And then they're like, oh, oh look, there's some gold, there's some silver, there's some clothes, there's a you know, denim jacket, there's a parker, or whatever. And then uh, they're thinking, wow, we're on a roll here. And they keep on going. And then they say to each other, there's nobody here. So they're, um, you know, they're indulging, eating and getting gold and putting nice clothes on. And then one of them says, or they, they all come to the conclusion, you know, here's us with all of this blessing. And yet the people inside the city are, are starving to death and they're eating each other. You know, if we don't go and tell them, something bad's going to happen. And so I apply this to the church that we have got good news. Amen. Yeah, very good news as we heard this morning. And we have got a responsibility to go and tell people. Yeah. And this is what, obviously what, Paul and the, and the gang are going to do in Georgia. Um, and sometimes the church thinks it's only the job of the evangelist. That's Paul's job is the pastor, that's Dougie's job, that's Stevie's job. But it's not my job, but it's everybody's job. Because if you remember, uh, Paul writing to Timothy, Timothy was a pastor. Yeah? Yes, and Paul says, do the work of an evangelist. Oh, I don't receive that. I, it can't be from God. I'm, I'm a pastor. And he's telling them to do the work of an evangelist. So there is a work to be done. And, um, you know, these people in the city, um, it's a bit like the world. The, they get so desperate that they eat each other. And in the world, people are destroying each other. You've got websites that teach people how to commit suicide. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As if to say, well look, if you're going to commit suicide, you may as well do it properly. <laughs> you don't want to do half of it, so this is how to do it. I mean, I've never seen them, but apparently there is. I would have thought, but I'm not that intelligent, I would have thought that the government would ban a website that teach, shows people how to kill themselves, but apparently not. This is the type of world we're living in. And the world is destroying each other. They're starving for spiritual food. And they're, and they're, they're squeezing the life out of each other. Whether it's with drugs, wrong relationships, um, lying to each other, conning each other. You know, whatever they're doing, that they're, they're destroying each other like what's happening in this city. And we've got the good news and another point to make is, is that it seemed like an impossible situation, but these lepers stepped out into it. And a lot of the things that God puts in front of you in your life, they seem impossible. That's why it takes faith to, to do them. Because logically, you would not do a lot of things that God tells you to do. Because they don't make logical sense. But God's not logical. He's, he's God. He's spiritual. And if we, we can't get this logical out of our mind, we're going to get disappointed so much. And we're never going to att attempt the impossible things. Because they're not logical. So like an example, I'm a street preacher. So I was preaching in Sunderland the other day, then in, in York on Friday and yesterday in Torquay. It was windy, it was cold, it was raining. It's just not logical to go out street preaching with a banner. <laughs> it's just like, oh, come on. But like, but God says go and do it. So one of the first guys that we're witness to, he stopped and had a bit of a chat. And as I was witnessing to him, he started, there was tears running down his cheek. 
So it, that's an example of, you know, it's not logical, but, but God very often calls me to do things that look impossible. Mm. And that's why we've got the scripture. Nothing is impossible with God. Yeah. Yeah. So you would may have, may have came to areas in your life and backed off because it looked impossible. And when things look impossible like, like this did, the army's there, God does a miracle, yeah. and they think they hear the sound of, of many, many armies when, when there's nobody there. Mm. And they, they just come plodding along, four lepers, and, and get all of the spoils. And last night when I asked the Lord for, for, a, for the word to get to bring, um, he turned this to Esther, where um, she has to speak up on part of the Jews' mm. behalf because the Haman uh, wants the Jews destroyed and he's already sent this decree out that, that, that they'll be killed. And uh, Mordecai says to her, you're, you're one of the king's wives. You've got, to, um, you've got to go and get this turned around. And she says, you, nobody is allowed to approach the king unless he invites you. Like, you can die if you just walk towards the king. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They just automatically drag you off and you haven't been invited, you, you could die. So she says that to Mordecai and he says, how do you know that you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this? And I believe there's people in this room and whatever your situation is, you, you could have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Like Paul starting this work so many years ago, been through a lot of discouragements, but a lot of encouragements. And uh, <coughs> the people in the church are reaping the benefits of the fact that Paul stood his ground Amen. and his wife and the people with him. Amen. But you as an individual, there could be a reason why you're, you know, in the area doing what you're doing. That could be far wider than what you think. Mm -hmm. And I'm finding as a Christian that I very often go to do something and I think I'm going to do that. Like, for example, the last time I went to Australia, before the time I've just been, I thought I was going to preach the gospel and do this. But one of the major reasons was, was to get into it, in touch with an apostle who is now linked up with the leaders, the leadership people in Newcastle. And he's, feed, he's feeding a lot of godly things into their life. It's called John Alley. You can look them up on, 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 on YouTube or on the internet. Um, so we, we sometimes think that we're, the reason that we're is for one thing and, and God can have a completely different reason. Yeah. And another thing to say is, is that there really is two types of Christian. Can I get a drink of water, uh, Stevie? Because <laughs> I drank, I had a drink of water, but I, I, I drank it. <laughs> there's two types of Christian there's a carnal Christian and there's a spiritual Christian and a carnal Christian is not necessarily doing evil but he is Lord of his own life <coughs> he or she yeah. so he goes out and does evangelism but he, he's the Lord thanks mate she has one for, one for Ron he, he makes the decisions or she makes the decisions. I'm going out to do evangelism, but I'm doing it my way and I'm going where I want and, and I'm the Lord. And that is the flesh. So you can apply that to pastoral work, prophetic work, school teacher, labourer, whatever. I'm in charge of my life. I'm a Christian. I'm on the way to heaven, but I'm going to do it my way. Now, I, I, I wonder if some of them people will actually get there. Because if you remember in Matthew chapter 7, it says, Lord, Lord he did this. Lord, he did that. Uh, you know, Jesus is like, oh, I never knew you. Away from me, you who commit iniquity. And what he means when he's saying know you, it's like in an ongoing way. I don't know if you've ever had this situation where you can wave at someone, aye, aye, but you don't really know them. You kind of know their face. But you don't know them. And this is the knowing that Jesus is on about. And born again Christians are meant to live a life that Jesus is Lord. Amen. He's calling the shots. Yes. And that's spiritual Christianity. 
And I only came to this revelation about, it just shows how slow I am, about three years ago. <laughs> three years ago. I was probably Lord of my life, although I was going around saying Jesus is Lord. But I was Lord, if I was honest. And I'll give you an example. Well, I, I sort of said, right, Lord, I want you to be Lord. I'm committing everything to you. The next morning I got up, I went to go to the allotment, and I put uh, my boots on, and the, the allotment stuff. Now, just to go out, go out the door, and the Lord went, you didn't ask me if you could go to the allotment? <laughs> and I said, well, well, I don't need to ask you. He said, well, you do if I'm Lord, because I'm Lord of every part of your life. And I went, oh, come on, Lord, this is getting silly. He said, he said, but you said last night that you wanted us to be Lord. I said, yeah, I did, didn't I? Okay, do you want us to go to the allotment? He said, no. I went, oh, come on, Lord. And he went, I went, okay. So I took the boots off and there I was in the house, mumbling and bumbling. I got a couple of really important phone calls where I needed to... Uh, write things down, I don't take the phone to the allotment because it either drops in the water or gets muddy. Mm -hmm. And then I sat down and I thought, why didn't you tell us that you didn't want us to go at the allotment and that these phone calls were going to happen? And he said, because you never asked us. <laughs> <laughs> See, when Jesus is your Lord, it's a two-way conversation. <laughs> and I'm telling you, there's a lot of Christians just, they take up half of the pastor's time because the things they're doing are in the flesh the pastor discerns it tries to explain it then they rebel against it and then he's like okay Lord I'll hand it over to you, you. preach it brother yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm challenging you this morning and asking you is Jesus really Lord of your life because if, if he's not it's a bit of a game and that's why so many people backslide because they're playing this game and they're not satisfied because they're Lord. They're doing all the stuff and they're like, oh, you know. And the world becomes so more, much more appealing. You know, it's there and they're like, hmm. So I'll have a little taste. You know, I'll have a little bit of the world because, yeah, I mean, Christianity is alright, but it's getting a bit boring. Um, and away they go. And before you know where it is, they're gone. So, but when you're in the spirit, your life is such an adventure. Amen. A complete, it, it's hard to put it into words. But obviously, I'm imagining that the, the compassion that people were showing and the passion for Jesus, that they must really, really know him, or you couldn't be coming out with the things that you're coming out with. Do you know what I mean? Amen. But is he a Lord? That, that's a challenge. So I've got a few scriptures to read. And they're quite, they don't really need a lot of explanation. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 4, 1 to 10. This is Paul, not long before he's going to die. So, um, he's writing to his disciple Paul. Paul's writing to his disciple Timothy. And another thing that I think, you know, God wants to stress is important in the church, is to, for, to make disciples and have spiritual fathers and have people who want to learn and because um, if you're a joiner you have an apprenticeship you, you learn you study you learn you watch the, the people who've been joiners for a long time and um, I was with a street preacher on Friday in York and he was a guy who I took out onto the street and trained him and uh, then we went our separate ways and, but he, because he was trained, he started doing it, and now he's training other people in, a, oh, in evangelism. Amen. Amen. And he's a very good preacher. He's probably a better preacher than me, but that's okay. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I, I disciple the guy called Davy Falkis, and he became a, a more vibrant Christian than me, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, if everybody's becoming a better Christian than you, it's only if you're insecure that you feel threatened. Mm -hmm. if, if you're free in the Lord and you're, you're, you know who you are in Jesus, <laughs> Why shouldn't everybody be a better Christian than you? Because we're all family anyway. Amen? Okay, 2, 2 Timothy chapter 4, and this is Paul talking to Timothy. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Re 
reprove, rebuke and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For a time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts they shall heap up to themselves teachers having itching ears. So I'm just going to explain something there. I, I believe that in the end times there's a, there's a parallel church. Yeah. There's the real church of Jesus Christ and there's another church, you can call it what you want, <coughs> I'm not going to, I don't like knocking people, but I'm just making this point because I believe it. And the, they say they believe, but there's the real church of Jesus Christ, God's elect. People who are willing to suffer, people who are willing to sacrifice and lay their lives down. And another group who just want to be happy and blessed and fed and looked after. And they're looking for things to happen that excites them. And, and the real church of Jesus Christ is following Jesus. Amen. And they're kind of going along like that. And um, one of them is going the wrong way in, in the true church. Because it, it does say in the word that in the end times, people will um, fall away from the faith, yeah. being deceived by doctrines of demons. Yeah. So this is a, another reason why it's important that we're hearing God. And somebody mentioned it with three times and it was like, hello, the saying to me, about listening to God's voice. It's very, very important and it, it is a thing that it does take a lot of time to learn. And it says that my sheep hear my voice. Amen. So we're meant to hear God. It's right throughout the Bible. I've had somebody say to me, yeah, but it's not in the Bible hearing God's voice. I'm saying, well, what Bible? Has your Bible got any pages in? <laughs> It's full of it. Hearing God's voice, hearing his instructions. Now we know he can speak to it different ways, but we've got to, we've got to, and it's, it's not really difficult to, when the devil, you know, to tell you to like rob a bank or sleep with your neighbor's wife or tell lies, that's pretty easy. But the bit that's hard to discern is your own soul. What you want to do compared to what God wants to do. And I'll give you an example. Um, when I was a fairly young Christian, I was asked to speak in the Sunday school class. So I went in and I sp spoke in the Sunday school class. And then the teacher at the end said, Dougie, um, I don't know how you're going to respond to this, but I feel that God's saying that you should take over the class. And I said, no, sorry. He said, well, will you pray about it? I said, definitely. So I went, Lord, you know, I went home and I went, Lord, did you hear what that man said? And do you know what I mean? And, and you know that you don't want me to, you know, to be a Sunday school teacher. And he said, I do. I said, you do? <laughs> so, so there's what we think is the right thing and what God wants could be, it, it's like the complete opposite. Amen. And we think, well, could there be other areas of my life where it's like that? Where I think I'm meant to be doing this when really God wants us to do that. How are you ever going to know unless you're asking God and, and really praying about it and really seeking the face of God. How are you ever going to know? We're, we're not going to know unless God tells with and share and, and teaches with. So, and they will turn away with that yes from the truth and they will be, they'll be turned into fables. But you, and this has been mentioned again today, watch in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of your ministry, for I am ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. And this is not his flight, this is his, e his execution, you know. I have, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I've kept the faith henceforth, has laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me on that day, and not to me only, but to those who love his appearing. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. And he has a key verse. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. And I'm just leaving that in half a verse. So he had a helper called Demas, who, you know, you're imagining that he's a believer, because he's helping him. But he's had to weigh up, like I said before, this present world. When he's went like that, and he's, and he's went, he's gone. So, this does happen. And it happened to Paul, and it can happen to us, and I'm sure Paul or anyone in this room who's been in Christian leadership will be able to tell you of people who were, who were with you, they were for it, they were trying to tell you that you weren't fiery enough, and uh, then they're just, boom, they're gone. 
Oh, it's Fred Bloggs. Yeah, well, I haven't seen him for a while. Well, he was the one believing for revival. Well, I haven't seen him. Well, I haven't seen him. And then years go by, but I haven't, but I haven't heard anything of him. He's gone. He loved this present world. So it does happen. <laughs> Next one is Isaiah 55, 6 and 9. I'm going to move on quick, quick, because the time's moving on. Isaiah 55. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts, this is God, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways, my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And then it, and then it goes on and explains it a bit. So there, we, there we've got God again saying that, you know, your thoughts are there, but his thoughts are higher. We've got to come up to him, up to his level. And um, and it, it's, it's back again. And, and I can't stress enough um, I was talking to somebody yesterday and this person was telling us that I've been trying to help this one and I helped that one and this one's let us down. And I said, what's your prayer life like? And the person went, it could improve. But then again, so could everybody. So I said, I'm not talking about everyone else. I'm talking about you. Mm -hmm. The person went, mm, I really need to get into prayer more. I said, you'll find... If you leave some of these people alone, not leave them alone, but stop running after them, and Paul mentioned this uh, earlier on, uh, you, but you get into prayer, and you talk to God, and you lift these people up, you'll find that these people will come, and what you've been trying to tell them, they'll, they'll tell you that God's told them to do that. And you will go, yeah, that's a great idea. Wow, this is much easier. And the person went, Oh wow! So then, then the next day came and the, and they were well, getting something to eat, and then it goes. Oh, would you like some food? And the person goes, No, I'm fasting. And then I looked down and the person went, Gotta get into it, Dougie. Gotta, you know, let's let's get into it. Let's, you know, she wanted to get into it and get it done. So I can't stress enough. I mean, I've helped to plant three church churches. And some people think, oh, it's just on the strength of your character and you're outgoing and you're an evangelist. It wasn't that. Me and the three people that I planted the churches, we looked at each other and went, we, we, can't, we can't change people. We, we, we can't, you know. So we, we had half nights of prayer. We went prayer walking. We had prayer coming out. Like, yes, there was prayer, prayer, prayer. And then things started to happen. So without prayer... It's, it's just not going to work. Yeah. So when I was a young Christian, I was at the 6.30 prayer meetings. And so I'm God willing, I'll, I'll, I'll be going with Paul on, on Monday to, to pray. I'm not saying I'm a great prayer or someone who really, really loves prayer, but I just know it's essential. Amen. It's like your Christian walk's just not going to work without it. Right, the last couple of scriptures, well, the, one of the last ones is Proverbs 11.30. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. And then the last scripture is Mark 16.15-20. And most of you probably know this one. It's, it's the Great Commission to go into all the world. And uh, I gave this scripture to someone to study once and he said, um, I don't fully understand uh, Mark, go into all the world. And I said to him, what, which part of go do you not understand? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, 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 I'm a kind of one man ministry called Go Ministries. And somebody says, what happened to Go Ministries? I said, they went. <laughs> that was it. So Mark 16, 15. Oops, there we go. Um, and Jesus is just rebuked the disciples for unbelief. So this normally you would think it would be just before he gives them a great commission. Hey lads, a great disciples, you know. 
couldn't find 12 better men or 11 better men, and, you know, but he's actually rebuking them for unbelief. And then he gives them the Great Commission. So God doesn't always do things the way we would do it. Um, Mark 16, 15. And Jesus, and he said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they will cast out devils. They will speak with new tongues. If they take up serpents, uh, they will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And there the disciples went forth and they preached everywhere. The Lord working with them, Amen. confirming the word with signs following. Amen. So, I believe that there's a go anointing. And I've experienced it. And um, I believe that, that Paul and the, and the team are going to experience Because when you go, yeah. Yeah, really, you're stepping out, mm -hmm. and it's you need God more. Mm -hmm. Usually, when you're at home, everything's pretty predictable, and you know, there might be a few different things. But when you go, you're really stepping out. And uh, when I was living in Gateshead, the Lord told us to give up my flat and go to Australia. So I gave away everything, and I ended up with one rucksack. I went to Australia, and then. Um, Nothing was planned. So I was there, nothing was planned. And I was like, okay, Lord, nothing planned. And the Holy Spirit like said to us, look, I'm in charge. There's nothing planned. But just, just follow me and watch what happens. And I ended up speaking in 14 different churches in Australia. I came back homeless into the airport yeah. again. Oh, that doggy. He's so un unlogical, you know. <laughs> you know... Did you hear what he's doing now? What? He's in Heathrow Airport when I went, oh, Dougie, please. This, this is getting really silly. But, but this is what God told us to do. I came back to Newcastle. I said, right, Lord, I'm back in Newcastle. And he said, phone this guy and ask him if he can put you up till you get a flat. Phone him up. He said, yeah, no bother. Put us up for three weeks. The Lord got us a flat and I'm in the flat. Yes. Yeah. And I'm back, back to, to normal. But my life has changed. Because in obedience... It just does bless. It just does something. It's hard to put it into words. But I'm not the same person. There's a different anointing on my life. Amen. I can't ex it's hard to explain. Mm -hmm. But it's because I took that step of obedience, of listening. Yes. I obeyed, yes. even though it wasn't logical. Yes. And I'm, I'm sure people are going to go away and say, nah, we need to be logical. I mean, Dougie's a little bit of that. He says, I'll take the person. I'm more of a logical person. And you'll persuade yourself out of it. But that's up to you. I've tried to show you it from the word. And God's a God of the impossible. And he's either trustworthy or he's not. Yeah. Yes. He's either God or he's not. Yeah. And if he's God. The pond of the Red Sea. The river Jordan and full flow stopping. Do you know when, do you know when, the, do you know when the sea parted? And when the, when the river blocked up? The first one was when Moses... Was, did what he was told to do, had his rod, and he waved it over there, the, like he was told. Wave a rod over there, over a, a sea, and expected to part. Not logical, is it? It parted. And step into the, the River Jordan, not, not when it's trickling down, when it's in full flood. Step into it, carrying the big, the big Ark of the Covenant. It was when they stepped into it, that's when the water stopped. So it's in the doing. Amen. It's in the stepping out. It's in the, you know, believing God. That's, that's where the change takes place. So that you get a miracle, but it changes you as well. It's as if God's saying, I can trust you with more. Because unbelief can be so in my lives that we're not even aware of it. I can hear it when people are talking to people, oh well, how's it going? Well? And then the pipe up with the people, and you're like, oh, unbelief. It's a killer. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pray, I'm gonna finish, I'm gonna I'm pray and I'm gonna finish. But at the end, if, if there's anything that's been said and you think that um, you would like prayer about that, 
um, Paul and the elders and whoever will be at the front to pray. But that's what that's the word that I believe God's given us for you. It's not like really dynamic, it's pretty basic. But um, sometimes we need to hear the basic things. Because we, we try to go on to these high things and the foundation's not properly laid at the bottom and then the house comes down. So unless the Lord builds the house, the labourers labour in vain. I'm just going to close in prayer. Father, I thank you for this morning. It's been an amazing morning. The worship, the words, so many different people contributing, Lord. And we know that you want to be 100% Lord of our lives. And I ask, Lord, that we can really get a hold of that. And I can get a hold of it more. And we pray, Lord, that the things that you've called what to do, we would discover them. Because you're not hiding them from the Lord. They're there. You know, they're there for you to instruct with and show with. And you've got a wonderful plan. And no matter how bad our life's been, God, um, you can turn it around and make it something beautiful. Amen. And uh, like your word, my last scripture, Lord, is your word in Isaiah. Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Amen. So Father, I just pray as we give our food and we'll go our separate ways today, Lord. We can take your word with us. And we can, um, we can be doers of the word, Lord, and not hear us only. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have I got uh, sound? Am I sound? Any no. sound? No. Uh, no. David? Oh, yeah. That's it. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Your Australian accent is really good. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> made me smile today and laugh. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Bless you. But you know what the Lord put on my heart? To ask you again, guys. <clears throat> there was a prayer meeting on Thursday. And I think that every single hand that should go up. Every single hand that if you're around this area in another way, then every single hand should say yes because it starts with prayer. Amen. 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 I'm not going to ask you to put your hand up again. Just put it on your heart. But if you can get here, get here. Have faith to get here. Because nothing, I tell you, nothing happens without prayer. Amen. Nothing. Be here. I want this place full. And I want David to say, you know, I can believe how many people, how many times I had to fill that flask. And call they ate all my biscuits and... <laughs> You know, praise the Lord. <laughs> Think out of the box, guys. Because uh, the Lord wants to hear your prayers. Just imagine that. Our Father, <coughs> Jesus, who died for us, wants to hear our prayers. When I started the prayers, on the Monday morning prayers, 23 years ago, I thought it was just for a month or so. He didn't tell me I'd be still be going at my age, 23 years later, still getting on a Monday morning and seeing, and we've seen amazing things over the years. And I think back and I, th I, I want to miss one of them. Not one of them. Thank you, Toby. Which Christian am I? Which Christian do you want to be? Do you want one of those that, you know, I did put my hand up years ago and uh, well, I dabble in this and I dabble in that and, you know, I don't go to many prayer meetings and, you know, anything during the week, you know, I'll go to church but it's, you know, really a social activity or you're going to be on fire for the Lord with a hunger and thirst. Spirit, just come. Just touch people, Father. Just touch them, Father. You have the desires of your heart. 
the Lord said. But in your heart, you've got to have that desire to serve him. Holy Spirit, just come. Let us afresh, Lord. Yeah. And those things that have got in our way over our, our life, those people that have cursed us and done harm to us. Maybe you've been in churches that hasn't done a lot of good and hurt you. Forgive them, Lord. Forgive them. For they know not what they do. Yes. But Father, I, and this is a prayer for you, I want to follow you. Amen. I want to hear you. Amen. I want to speak in that heavenly language. Yes. I've got that desire. Whatever you have for me, I want to do. And how crazy it is in the world's eyes. You know, my, my forklift <clears throat> has had a flat tire for a number of weeks. And I keep on thinking, I've got to get it done. I've blown it up and it lasts overnight and I've used it and the following morning it's flat. And I think, oh, I don't need to use it there, I'll leave it flat. And then on Wednesday, I thought, I really need to get it mended. I need to get it fixed. And the guy who does um, mobile repairs, I've lost it, lost his number. And he's, I've used him over the years. You think I've been in business, you know, nearly 25 years. Um, so I phoned a friend. And uh, I said, text me uh, with his number. And he said, oh yeah, text me. And I phoned him right away, Derek. And uh, I said, Derek, I, he said, oh, I remember coming up to your place. He said, I mended a, a tyre last uh, at, um, on your trailer. I went, yeah, that's it. And he said, yeah, yeah, I remember. He said, uh, I said, when you, could you come in half an hour? I went, oh, okay, half an hour, great. So he came up. And you know, he didn't look well. I said, are you all right? He said, no. He said, I've had a blood, blood clot on the lung and a blood clot on the leg and... I've had this trouble and that. He said, I, and I've just got no energy. And, you know, <coughs> and I just felt the Lord say, pray for him. And I went, would you like a cup of tea? He said, oh, yes, please. And I said, you know, I think that you need some minerals and you, you need a tonic. And uh, anyway, when I went and made a cup of tea, I had a look at, and Angela's got a bit of tonic left. I've eaten, I uh, drank all night. And so, because sometimes, you know, we need bit of minerals and other things, you know, that all gives you wisdom, doesn't it? Um, and I took it up to him, took him this cup of tea, and I said, Derek, can I pray for you? And he went, oh, yes, please. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. And I prayed for him, and he was in tears while I prayed for him. Mm. And you know the presence of the Lord? Mm. Wonderful. Opportunities. Mm. And we all have opportunities mm. to pray for people, to mention Jesus to them. Because there's so many sad people out there, so many ill people, and they're going to hell. They're going to hell, guys. Mm. We might be all right. We might be on that narrow road. But there's so many on that wide road going to hell. Mm -hmm. And that's what the Lord's really been putting on my heart lately. I don't want to batter you, but I'm just saying, you know, Lord. That's what you need to say, Lord. And through prayer. You need to be in that place. Mm -hmm. Open those opportunities, Lord. Those divine appointments, wherever it is. We don't have to speak to the multitudes. We can speak to somebody's at the till. And I, you know, I could speak all day. But, you know, <laughs> on situations and opportunities the Lord has given me. Yes. Opportunities. Yeah, Father, I just thank you for this morning. Thank you. But Father, we have come into your presence. Amen. And I say again that you didn't come into ours. We came into yours now. Yes. This is your place. Thank you, Miss. And Father, thank you that you've put the prayers on our hearts, the scriptures on our hearts. Thank you for Dougie. 
for preaching, Lord, and uh, the way he does preach, Father. It's from the heart and at the struggle, Lord. And you just, I've never heard anybody else preach like Dougie, and I thank you, Father, for to be individual. I thank you for Sam leading us in prayer uh, and worship this morning. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Lord, that we've come into your presence. Thank you that we were a family. Yes. Wherever we go in the world, we're a family. Wherever I go, I always think, thank you, Lord, for Mount Olive. I just love to be there. Hmm. So bless you, Father.